Greetings and salutations, young true believers. Today is the teleological or design argument. The design argument is pretty straightforward, uh, at least in its initial initial uh, framework. Um, the argument is is this: uh, we look at the world, and the world is obviously complex, and we in our experience, consistent with our experience, com we find that complex things are designed by intelligent beings. So uh, this argument is ancient. It, I mean, most, most philosophical arguments you're going to come across ever have ancient roots, but this one uh, is, and this one's no exception, but its most famous uh, iteration was, was conveyed by an English philosopher, uh, theologian named William Paley in the 18th century. And Paley likens, uh, he, he wants to use, again, argument from analogy. You're going to see many arguments from analogy uh, in philosophy. You see them in law. You see them in science. Arguments from analogy, get used to those. Get comfortable with them because they are indispensable. Uh, they allow you to explain the unfamiliar in terms of the familiar. That's why they're so popular. But anyway, Paley asks us to imagine we're walking through a, a, a field, a heath, as you know, the English call it. And you stumble upon a watch, you know, one of the old watches to hang on a chain, right? Not a, a wristwatch. And you look at it and you examine it. And quote from Paley here, this mechanism, the watch being observed, the inference we think is inevitable that the watch must have had a maker, that there must have existed at some time and at some place or other, an artificer, that is to say a designer, right? Or artificers who formed it for the purpose which we find it actually to answer. Every indication of contrivance, every manifestation of design which existed in the watch exists in the works of nature with the difference on the side of nature of being greater and more, and that in a degree which is which exceeds, excuse me, all computation, right? We make complex things, we're intelligent, the world is complex, the universe is complex, ergo, it must have had a designer. Now, it has been pointed out by a myriad philosophers through the centuries, right? There are serious problems with this argument. Number one, David Hume, the great Scottish philosopher, objects to this. He was a contemporary of Paley. He rejects this argument on these grounds. Well, he actually objects to it on several grounds. One, uh, it's inaccurate to say that the universe resembles a great machine because the universe, and you know, we can restrict ourselves to planet Earth, Material is recycled. We decay. Our the the, uh, the nutrients in our body go into the ground, nourish grass, nourish trees, which in turn nourish animals. In short, all the matter is recycled. Nature is one efficient recycler, right? And this would suggest that it's inaccurate to say that the world is like a machine. It's more like a living being in that respect. So the analogy breaks down. Hume further goes on to say the analogy is weak as well because if the if the theist is going to use this argument to try to establish the existence of a god there's a problem because this argument is actually more con more consistent again consistent with our experience with there being multiple gods because we know for example that uh homes and and stadiums and uh universities and just anything that human beings build are often more often than not built by teams of designers so this this argument is much more consistent with polytheism, that is to say many gods, than it is with monotheism, one god. But Hume's most devastating critique of this argument is this. Uh, there's a phenomenon in psychology called projection in which you attribute your motives to the person that you are criticizing. Uh, this is a well-documented psychological theory and Hume uh, was writing before psychology became a formal science, but he was well aware of this phenomenon, right? And what he argues is that human beings look out in the natural world, see complexity, and attribute, what we do is we attribute our motives to the natural world. We design complicated things because we're intelligent. The world seems complicated. Some intelligence must have designed it, but it does not follow that complexity equals intelligence, right? That the only way to get something complex is because there's an intelligence behind it driving it. So that's the uh, that's the critique of the design argument, uh, the teleological argument. So um, on to the next argument, which is the um, the ontological argument. This is the argument 
a uh, famous argument that comes to us from Saint Anselm, right? And unlike the teleological and the cosmological arguments, the ontological argument is a a priori argument. So in other words, what Saint Anselm's doing, he's he's not looking at the world and arguing back from the world to the existence of God. What he's doing is that he's he's looking at the concept of God itself, examining the concept of God and trying to ascertain whether or not the concept of God falls out of the definition of God. So that's where his argument starts. So let's take a look at the ontological argument. This appears on page 96 of the Vaughn text. So premise one, God by definition is the greatest being possible. And we, we talked about God's attributes yesterday, all knowing, all powerful, all good, eternal, unchangeable. So premise two, suppose that the greatest being possible exists only in the understanding, that is to say, in the mind, but not as an external object, just as a mental object. Three, then a greater being than the greatest possible being can be conceived, one existing not just in the understanding, but also in reality. But this yields a contradiction, because that would mean that there is a greater being conceivable than the greatest possible being, namely a being that is greatest and also exists. But again, when you get a contradiction, something has to give. So Anselm concludes, therefore, God, the greatest possible being must exist in reality and not just as a mental object or not just in the understanding. Now, this argument befuddled, I mean, it really, it threw philosophers over a long time because it seemed like there was something wrong with it, but nobody could put their finger on what was wrong with it. Well, Gang, in order to show you what's wrong with it, I have to give you a, a brief primer on logical fallacies. A logical fallacy is a mistake in reasoning, right? And one of the most elementary logical fallacies goes something like this. If I tell you you should drink tea, it's beneficial for you to drink green tea, for example. And you say, why? And I say, because it's so very good for you. What I've done is I've just restated the argument in a different way. In other words, I made the argument self-referential. This is the logical fallacy known as begging the question or circular reasoning. And what happens when you reason in a circle is you assume the truth of what you're trying to prove. In other words, the logical flow of any argument is from the premises, which is the, the part of the argument that contains the evidence or the, the reasoning for the conclusion, which is the second part, which contains that part of the argument that you're trying to establish, that you're trying to prove. So what happens when we reason in a circle is we smuggle the conclusion of our argument into the premises of that same argument and make the argument self-referential. You can't assume the truth of what you're trying to prove. You can't, in other words, use the conclusion of one argument as a premise in that same argument. You can use the conclusion of one argument as a premise in a different argument, but not in the same argument. So that's what's known as, as circular reasoning. And this is what St. Anselm is guilty of. He assumes the truth of the existence of the greatest possible being, which is exactly what he's trying to demonstrate. So for tomorrow, we will talk about the atheist primary objection to the existence of God. That is the problem of evil. And we'll start to talk about theodicies, theodicies being theistic attempts, that is to say attempts on behalf, on behalf of believers to formulate objections to the problem from evil.